Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Portnoy. The novel that made Philip Roth famous and turned several rabbis and Jewish leaders against him in America and in Israel. This was 1969, when I, many years later, read about the reactions at the time, I felt very sorry for the author. People he respected said terrible things about the book. Gershom Sholem denounced it from Jerusalem. And in New York, the famous Irving Howe called it an empty story, a book lacking real content. Oy. Bernard Avishai is a writer and author, professor of government at Dartmouth College, resides both in Israel and the US, writes on a regular basis for The New Yorker, and was a friend of Philip Roth, and even wrote a book about this novel. He will now be our guide to Portnoy. Please give Bernie a warm welcome. And it was a sensation. It was an experience unlike any I was ever to know in the future, and unlike anything that had happened to me in the past. Really. Because this was a scandal. Nothing in my education prepared me to be a scandalous writer. I thought I was going to be a serious writer. But the moment I became comical and freewheeling in this way, I became a scandalous writer. This hero is not just some miserable wretch writhing in his lusts. He is the Jew avenging himself of his upbringing in a Jewish home, which has become detestable to him, by going out and laying shiksas, thereby freeing himself from the nightmare of Mama. This is the book for which all anti-Semites have been praying. I dare say that with the next turn of history, this book will make all of us defendants at court. We will pay the price, not the author who revels in obscenities. You know, Irving Howe's name has been raised here a couple of times, and uh, I have to say, I was very fond of him. It was very close to Irving Howe. Um, after he had reviewed Portnoy's complaint in Commentary Magazine in 1972. Um, uh, I remained very close to him. I used to sleep at his house in New York and then go have dinner with Philip at night and come, come back. And uh, what Irving had done in that review, he started it off by saying that the cruelest thing one could do with Portnoy's complaint was read it twice. <laughs> and I used to tell him, why would you reread it when the first time was unforgettable? And back when the book was published exactly 50 years ago, I knew people who sat around in coffee shops and student unions and living room floors reading the entire book out loud to one another. Its characters became instant archetypes. Sophie especially Sophie, the monkey, my father, cousin Heshi, Rabbi Warshaw, Dr. Spielvogel. We laughed and teased and blushed. Only Portnoy wasn't laughing. Who in the history of the world has been least able to deal with a woman's tears? My father, I am second. He says to me, you heard your mother, don't eat french fries with Melvin Weiner after school. Or ever, she pleads, or ever, my father says. Or hamburgers out, she pleads, or hamburgers, she, he says. Hamburgers, she says bitterly just as she might say Hitler. Where they can put anything in the world they want and he eats them, Jack. Make him promise before he gives himself a terrible tzura and it's too late. I promise, I scream, I promise and race from the kitchen. To where? Where else? I tear off my pants furiously. I grab that 
battered, battering ram to freedom, my adolescent cock. Even as my mother begins to call from the other side of the bathroom door, now this time don't flush. Do you hear me, Alex? I have to see what's in that bowl. <laughs> Doctor, do you understand what I was up against? My wang was all I had that I could call my own. Ja, men du hör inte vad jag säger. Jag tror inte på Gud. Jag tror inte på judarnas religion och ingen annan religion heller. Det är bara lögn. Alltihopa. Jaha, jag sa, jag har min sann. Det är det. Jag, jag tänker inte bära mig åt som om det var något särskilt. Men de där helgdagarna när det inte är det och jag, jag menar det. Ja, för herr Stöddig så är det kanske inget särskilt med dem där. För att han inte vet något om dem. Vad vet du om Ross Hashanas historia? Vad vet du? Vet du en? En sak, eller kanske två, vet du? Vad vet du om judarnas historia? Eftersom du kan kalla deras religion som har dukt åt folk. Som har varit bra mycket klyftigare än du och... Bra mycket äldre än du i 2000 år som gör att du kan kalla allt detta lidande och all deras smärta för lögn. Ja, men det, det finns ingenting som, som en gud det har aldrig funnits det heller. Jag är hemskt ledsen. Men i min ordlista så kallas det för lögn. Jaha, men, men vem var det då som skapade världen, Alex? Frågar han föraktfullt. Det råkade, ja den råkade väl bara bli till då om jag, om jag får tro dig. Alex, säger min syster. Det enda pappa menar är att även om du inte vill gå med honom så kunde du väl i alla fall byta kläder. Men varför då, skriker jag. För någonting som aldrig har existerat. Varför ber ni inte mig gå ut och byta kläder för ett kattkräks eller ett träds skull? Ja, de existerar ju åtminstone. Den, den lärde allvetaren har inte svarat på min fråga än, säger far. Försök inte byta ämne. Vem skapade världen? Och människorna? Hm? I, ingen? Ja, just det, just det, pappa. Ingen. Åh, oh, kan man tänka sig, säger far. Det är snillrikt, väldigt snillrikt. Jag är glad att jag inte har gått i high school. Om det är så snillrik man blir av att göra det. Alex, säger min syster, och mjukt som hon brukar mjukt. För hon är redan en smula knäckt, hon också. Och om du bara kan ta på dig ett par skor. Nej, men du är ju lika knasig som han är, Anna. Om det inte finns någon gud, vad spelar det då för roll med skorna? En enda dag, en enda dag om året ber man honom om en tjänst. Men det är han för märkvärdig för. Så är det med den saken, Hanna. Så är det med din bror, hans respekt och hans kärlek. Nej, men pappa, nej, nej, nej. Men han är en bra pojke, pappa. Han har visst respekt för det. Han tycker ju visst om dig. Och judarna då? Mm. Mm. Hur, hur är det med judarna då? Nu skriker han och fäktar med armarna. Eftersom han hoppas att det ska hindra honom från att brista i gråt. Ordet kärlek behöver nämligen bara viskas i vårt hus för att allas ögon redan ska börja svämma över. Judarna har han någon respekt för dem, va? Lika mycket som för mig. Precis exakt lika mycket. Och plötsligt ilsknar han till. Han vänder sig mot mig med en ny och lysande tanke. Skulle min högt bildade son vilja tala om för mig... Vill du tala om för mig en sak? Vet du någonting om Talmud? Vet du någonting om historia? Ett, tu, tre, så var du bar mitzvah. Och det var slutet på all religionsundervisning för din del. Vet du, vet du att det finns sådana som studerar den judiska religionen i hela sitt liv? Och när de dör så är de ändå inte färdiga. Så tala nu om för mig, du som är helt färdig med judendomen nu när du är 14. Vet du ett enda duck om sagan? Om ditt folks underbara historia och arv? Redan rinner dock tårarna när ni på honom. 
Och flera är på väg från ögonen. Stort A. Stort A i skolan, säger han. Men när det gäller livet, då är han lika okunnig som den dag han föddes. Nu, nu, nu tycks det. Det tycks som om tiden till sist är inne. Så jag, jag säger det. Det är någonting som jag har vetat sedan en tid tillbaka. Jag säger det. Pappa, det är du som är okunnig. Du, pappa. Tack. I must say it's always a little hard coming down from from a reading of Portnoy's complaint. When I wrote a book about it, I remember thinking that people will like to read a book about Portnoy's complaint about as much as they would like to see their cousin's photos of Prague. <laughs> um, and, and, and so we go on. So we remember, we remember Portnoy stabbing pitilessly at mothers, plugged up fathers, dizzying shikses in heat. We remember Portnoy erupting on the analyst's couch the way we might, as if we could really imagine, let alone afford the analyst's couch. Let's get this out of the way, actually, Judith already did, that you can get intelligent aging people to laugh out loud just by saying the words Alex and liver. <laughs> what most bothered Irving Howe was Portnoy's mockery of his bourgeois Jewish family, though. And this was immediately assumed to mean Jews in general, which in 1969 seemed especially brazen, chutzpahdik. It was only 27 years after 1942 and 21 years after 1948. American Jews thought that they had earned a kind of moral intermission. One Portnoy seemed not to be respecting. It was also just two years after the 1967 war, which had made diaspora Jews an organized American Zionist inarguably, now unimaginably, cool. Portnoy's sexual angst suggested that Jews were anything but cool. You put the id back in yid, Portnoy instructed, and you come to understand the oi in goy. <laughs> so Roth, through Portnoy, seemed the satirist par excellence, particularly of the American Jewish community. I mean, Portnoy had such a mouth on him, so subtle, so schmutzig. Worse, he seemed so smart. He gave Western literature probably its greatest alliteration, publicly pleasing my parents while privately pulling my putts. Roth's early stories collected in Goodbye Columbus had already proven the menace of his wit. Rabbi Dr. Emanuel Rachman, who later became president of Bar Ilan University, wrote that if Roth wanted to point out problems with the Jewish community, he ought to have published in a Jewish periodical, or better, in Hebrew. <laughs> what is being done to silence this man? Rackman wrote to the Anti-Defamation League, medieval Jews would know what to do with him. <laughs> so Roth had reasons to retaliate. When I first met Philip Roth in 1974, he said that rabbinic bullies like Rackman had in a way liberated him to write Portnoy's complaint. Okay, I thought, you want to fight? Let's fight. It all seemed clear enough, didn't it? Wasn't the narrating Portnoy, didn't the narrating Portnoy under the cover of the psychoanalytic couch make public and intensify Roth's own sexual lusts and views of Jews? Wasn't Portnoy Roth? 
No, it did not. No, he was not. A novel in the form of a confession is for God's sake, not a confession in the form of a novel. For Roth, the laugh is on Portnoy too, especially on Portnoy, on the rhetoric of a frantic, sexually tortured young man trying to make sense of his origins in the partial, mocking way children do about parents and relatives. A man tormented because he stopped liking the people he loves. Yes, our hero sees what's grotesque, what's repressive, and it drives him crazy. But that's precisely because he feels sexually pathetic and his affection for his family is so strong. Roth taught the book at Bard College and shared his lecture notes with me. The greatest object of the satire, he writes, is the narrating Portnoy. Listen, Portnoy. The hysteria, the superstition, the watchets and the be carefuls. You mustn't do this, you can't do that, hold it, don't, you're breaking an important law. Oh, and the milchiks and flashiks besides, all those Meshuggahna rules and regulations on top of their own private craziness. It's a family joke that when I was a tiny child, I turned from the window out of which I was watching a snowstorm and hopefully asked, Mama, do we believe in winter? <laughs> the pathos is delicious. And when you think about it, the indecency Portnoy feels is not really about sex. It's about the loss of self-possession, letting go, the loss of self-possession, the ultimate bourgeois possession. Roth's point, which he wrote about in his wonderful essay, of 1974, which he wrote in the New York Review of Books, Imagining Jews, is that Jews no more than other humans could fight successfully against, quote, the non-negotiable demands of crude antisocial appetite and vulgar aggressive fantasy. Portnoy's honesty seemed indecent because American Jews had become something like the poster ch children the, the exemplars, the poster children for the kind of restraint and public decorum that the word bourgeois conveyed. In post-war America, Hollywood served up images of Jewish lawyers and doctors, big shots, who keep their heads while others didn't. Who else but Jews might show the way? Who if not a white bearded rabbi marched with Dr. Martin Luther King? Elizabeth Taylor and Sammy Davis Jr. went down into crisis and came up converted. <laughs> it was a Jewy soda fountain owner who lamented the violence afflicting the sharks and the jets. Remember from West Side Story, the sharks and the jets. Why can't you kids just get along? Why can't you get along? Jews controlled themselves so well, partly because they had been a scorned minority and had learn to ingratiate themselves, but also as little Alex had intuited, because Jews had a religious culture that could seem a divine restraining order. What else, I ask you, were all those prohibitive dietary rules and regulations all about to begin with, doctor? What else but to give us little Jewish children practice in being repressed Practice, darling. Practice, practice, practice. Why else the two sets of dishes? Why else the kosher soap and salt? Why else, I ask you, but to remind us three times a day that life is boundaries and restrictions. If it's anything, hundreds of thousands of little rules laid down by none other than none other. Thus, the American embodiment of self-restraint cannot restrain himself, at least not in private, where lovers and analysts learn the truth. Needless to say, a great many critics, not just Howe and Gershom Scholem, didn't really get it. I mean that the joke was meant to be especially on Portnoy because Portnoy was no more than a young man. Moreover, Portnoy's honesty about his brazen, guilty, 
frustrated sexual hungers would not only not provoke anti-Semitism, but was a kind of announcement that American Jews had arrived. Curiously, Portnoy's complaints very aggression seemed to drain sentiments that had pooled around the pretensions of our Anti-Defamation League. No, we were not all Bernard Malamud's saints. For us, too, sexual junk was lurking under moral righteousness. Portnoy in Tel Aviv whines to his Zionist dish, Naomi, who accuses him of being a self-hating Jew. Ah, but Naomi, maybe that's the best kind. <laughs> you could almost hear our non-Jewish friends sighing with relief. None of this would have worked had the psychoanalytic room not been convincingly enigmatic, leaving readers no vantage point, no moral pivot, nothing but an eavesdropping on an analysand and an analyst, both of whom seemed verging on parody. This is the book's virtuoso achievement. We don't have here just any stream of consciousness. This is stream of consciousness that costs you a couple of hundred bucks an hour, four days a week, and you inevitably become pretty practiced at it. In his infamous chapter that Roth calls whacking off, for example, Portnoy's memory of the butcher shop leads to a discovery of a little dot on his penis, which is certainly cancer the only fit punishment for a crime of violating his family's dinner. But now a mature, ironic erudition intrudes. I am the Raskolnikov of jerking off, he says. <laughs> My God, Portnoy asks, what is freedom and what is merely shaking the bars and so on? You start with the grievance you see, then move to the fantasy of retribution, then to guilt, and then to an original childhood fear. You dwell on the fear, and then, in a tribute to the safety of the couch, move to sadness. As you search for the sources of sadness, you uncover memory, which provokes feelings of poignancy, of loving connection, then hunger, then erotic charges, then loss, then a new, or putatively new, grievance. You start with pain, burrow into dirt, get to memory, and end with motive. There is nothing really free about the associations here. One thing leads to another because at least in psychoanalytic terms, each thought follows from the other. Roth presumed an audience familiar with the rhythms of the psychoanalytic project, so he let things rip. He also presumed you knew psychoanalytic theory and therefore how Portnoy's Jewish family made things all topsy-turvy. Oedipus complex? My God, the knife is in mommy's hand. The superego comes as a low-voltage father who cannot stop struggling with his bowels. The angst persists well beyond infancy because the son is preferred over the father. The only thing worse than Oedipal tension is Oedipal victory. And community only colludes in this inversion. In a Jewish home, the superego had a 5,000 year head start. Some readers concluded that, therefore, the forbearing Dr. Spielvogel must be the only vindicated character in the novel, that Roth was valorizing an old secular Jewish type, skeptical, like Freud, of the culture of Judaism. Alas, the enigma of Portnoy's complaining is bigger yet, for the novel leaves us with the lingering suspicion that Spielvogel, too, represents an orthodoxy, leaves us wondering if Spielvogel thinks he has an explanation for everything, from pleasure to process, that there is hubris in Spielvogel's authority, too. Remember Spielvogel's definition of Portnoy's complaint on the front piece of the book. Quote, a disorder in which strongly felt and altruistic impulses are perpetually warring with extreme sexual longing 
often of a perverse nature. In this context, with Portnoy squirming so truthfully, could anything be more condescending than the word perverse? Now we may perhaps to begin, yes? Poor Portnoy, now trying to please his doctor the way he had tried to please his mother and father. Portnoy keeps wanting to be healthy in the classical way a well-analyzed man is expected to be. That he wishes he had a strong preempting father, a guilt-free memory of mother's love, so that he could, according to the theory, stop lusting for a wilderness of monkeys. You see, I just can't stop or tie myself to anyone, Portnoy shouts. He's relentlessly hoping for the very cure that Spielvogel seems poised to supply. But the rhetoric of Portnoy's monologue and the construction he puts on his family both seem to be supplied by Spielvogel too. Not coincidentally, Roth told me, he had just finished an analysis with a psychoanalyst quite like Spielvogel, whom Adam knows rather well, who tried to persuade Roth that narcissism was the source of his art and his domineering mother and weak father were the source of his narcissism. <laughs> Philip told me, it frustrated me <laughs> terribly because his characterization of my mother and father was so false. But he gave me the good idea. This was a better family to use than my family. And that's around the time, he says, I went to Iowa to teach writing, where I had a disproportionately high number of Jewish students. And again, they'd write about this folkloric Jewish family, tough mother, weak father. Their stories may have been true in their detail, but never mind. The stories were organized around this folklore. I said, fine, you want this Jewish family? I'll give it to you. Portnoy's complaint at its deepest is thus meant to explode the idea of the psychiatric perverse, the psychiatric normal. Roth told me, once you take the categories of illness and health seriously, then you are leaving the atmosphere of this book. Then you are beginning to impose another vocabulary and a foreign alien vocabulary on this book. Of all the orthodoxies undermined in Portnoy's complaint, psychoanalytic orthodoxy may be the most insidious because it's the most hidden. Spielvogel is also a weaver of fictions, but to write fiction well, Roth implies, you first have to acknowledge that you're doing it at all. Portnoy's complaint left us laughing and queasy and talking. Can you really say this? Is this also me? Was the doctor really right? The joke was on everybody, parents, lovers, Jews, patients, analysts, which is another way of saying it was on the act of reading itself. We get things wrong, he says, somewhere else, he writes, we get things wrong and then after careful consideration, get things wrong again. Der Mensch tracht und Gott lacht, men strive, God laughs. And so, though I know I should be pitied for saying this, although Adam kind of opened the door to it, I consider Portnoy's complaint something like the culmination of the 60s in America, a decade of advancing civil rights, a decade of awakening to, liberals, to liberalism's full implications. Why? Because we were supposed to be judged, said Dr. King, not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And the trailing insight of Portnoy's complaint was that judging character was not going to be as easy as it sounded. Character is made of enmeshment, like the Jewish family, and is described by fictions, like psychoanalysis. Portnoy's complaint aimed to prove liberalism's largest, most precious moral claim, that all orthodoxy is suspect, that precisely because language and experience are relative, the principle of tolerance must be absolute, 
No text is sacred. Only the right to interpret texts is sacred. At the end of his life, Roth insisted that he himself could not reread Portnoy's complaint. But he was being too hard on his younger self. The book was a milestone in a life's work. That work would show us, ironically, how little a work our lives are. Waiting for a clip, a film clip. Is that coming up? Waiting for the orchestra.